right, everyone. I am here with Jordanis Karenidis. Jordanis is Research Director at CNRS in Paris. Uh, that's the National Center for Scientific Research, as well as the Head of Quantum Algorithms with QCWare. Jordanis, welcome to the Twimla AI Podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. It's been a while, about a year, a little over a year since we talked about quantum machine learning on the, the show here. And I imagine that the field has advanced uh, quite a bit. So I'm looking forward to uh, an update as well as your take. You recently delivered a main conference keynote at ICML on the topic. So you know, can we say that quantum machine learning is going big time now or blowing up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always say that uh, quantum machine learning is uh, the most overhyped and underestimated uh, area of quantum computing, and it can be both in superposition, right? So <laughs> I think we have many exciting new results. This is true. And to me, it was very important to, to give this uh, talk at ICML because I really believe in in uh, the fact that we need to work together, the quantum and the classical ML community, because you know you have the problems, you know you know what what are the bottlenecks on the computational side. You've been looking at these problems and the specifics for many years. We are coming from quantum algorithms. We understand what quantum computing can offer, and if we put these things together, I think we can do great things together. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you come to work at, uh, on quantum machine learning? Mm -hmm. So I started working on quantum algorithms more general uh, 20 years ago. So I started my PhD in 2000 in uh, Berkeley. So I was in California for a few years. And there I worked on different things, mostly quantum algorithms for communication networks and for cryptography and some quantum algorithms, not so much on machine learning. And I, the only machine learning I, I did was a classical result on uh, classical recommendation systems through an internship that I did with Prabhakar Raghavan uh, at some point in the beginning of 2000. And uh, after that, I went to MIT. I worked with Peter Shore for a couple of years, and then I moved to Paris in 2006 as a research director for CNRS. Okay. And, and so you've been working on quantum algorithms for for 20 years. How long has quantum algorithms even been a thing? <laughs> uh, not much more than that. So, 21 years? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think that the first uh, breakthrough result that people uh, cite on quantum algorithms is Peter Shor's algorithm for factoring large numbers. And this was in 93. So it's like 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was kind of the result that made people very interested in looking at this new model of computation and try to figure out what does it have to, to offer when we, when we uh, look at trying to compute and encode information using quantum mechanics and not uh, classical physics, right? So to me, it's, it's a very exciting thing because... Uh, it kind of tries to understand in some sense also what are the, the computational limits of nature, right? Because nature is a quantum mechanical system. So this is what we try to, to understand. And maybe it's important to say in the beginning that quantum computing is not a faster processor, right? So it is not that everything that you run nowadays on a classical computer, you can just put it on a quantum computer and it will run faster. This is really not... Uh, how it works. It's a completely different uh, paradigm. It's a different way of computing. And we need to design new algorithms and different algorithms in order to harness the power of quantum mechanics. And we can do it for certain tasks and we can provide algorithms that run much faster, even exponentially faster sometimes compared to classical computers. But this is not always the case. For many, for many tasks, a classical computer is, will be as good as a quantum computer. So we need to figure out exactly for what applications a quantum computer can offer something uh, more, whether it is about speed up, uh, speeds or speed or performance. And to do that, we need to look at the algorithms and design new algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, the 
has in what ways has the way that we think about the the computing itself uh quantum computing changed over the the these 27 you know mm -hmm. plus years uh yeah. has it just been you know, advancing you know getting more qubits or or has the fundamental architecture or approaches of, of quantum computing changed mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess in the beginning, there were two quite disjoint communities that were working on quantum information. I come from the theoretical computer science part and there quantum computing was something which it was completely theoretical, was part of like the theoretical computer science groups uh, as in Berkeley or in other places. And it was just a model of computation that we were trying to understand uh, what we can do with it. It was something completely mathematical and abstract. Mm -hmm. We had no idea if it would ever, you know, uh, no could ever realize <laughs> exactly. But in some sense, we were almost mathematicians, so we didn't care about these things, right? Mm -hmm. It was a great thing to, to, to do math, and we were proving theorems, right? At the same time, uh, physicists were trying to actually implement and figure out ways to control this very, very small quantum systems that could be one electron or one photon or one atom, right? And in order to be able to control this type of systems, you need a very, very precise ways of, of doing it. So, and physicists in the beginning were doing this because they, were, they wanted to study physics, right? And understand the laws of uh, physics. And little by little, you know, the two communities started coming together because on our side, we were saying, look, if we had the quantum computer, there are all these amazing things that you can do. And I think the physicists realized that maybe there is more to do than study physics. And they started getting into doing circuits and gates and qubits. Mm -hmm. and, and little by little, we started seeing the first very small quantum machines. Uh, we are quite far still from having a universal fault-tolerant quantum computer. But we have seen many strides when it comes to the hardware development. We've seen Google's announcement uh, a few months ago about the supremacy experiment. Uh, many other technologies are, are you know, uh, there, not only for superconducting qubits, but with trapped ions uh, and other technologies. And we also, I think, have many advances when it comes to, to thinking algorithmically about this model of computing. There have been many new algorithms. And quantum machine learning is something that started quite later. So I think that the result that kind of initiated this, um, this subfield was the quantum algorithm for solving linear systems. And that was sometime in 2009. So mm -hmm. I could say that quantum machine learning started maybe very, you know, uh, sporadically from 2009. Okay. And then we had uh, kind of the first end-to-end -end application on quantum recommendation system in a theoretical paper sometime in 2016. So between five and 10 years of quantum machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then was it the quantum recommendation algorithm that, uh, that Ewan Tang did that research about? Um, we did a show with Ewan uh, mm -hmm. just about a year ago, April of, of last year, on um, mm -hmm. some of that research. Yeah. So yes, it was exactly this, this quantum recommendation systems. It's a very interesting story in the sense that, um, you know, I, I, I was getting to, to know these new quantum techniques that had to do with linear algebra. And because I had worked on classical recommendation systems back in 2001, I kind of figured out that maybe this is the right problem to actually look into and try to find a quantum algorithm. So we started working with uh, my co-author, uh, Anupam Prakash, and we came up with this uh, quantum application. And uh, in the beginning, we, you know, we benchmarked our result compared to the best classical results that existed out there. And we could say that there was an exponential gap between our quantum algorithm and the, and the classical algorithm. And then uh, probably Erin, uh, you know, um, said more about this. She started working on this problem in the beginning in order to prove that classical algorithms cannot do better than the ones we already had. But little by little, she realized that maybe there are some different techniques inspired by our quantum algorithm that could give you a new classical algorithm, right? And this is what happened. She came up with a very nice classical uh, result. 
uh, that showed that at least in theory, the, the, the gap, the speed, the speed up that we can expect between the quantum and the classical algorithm is not any more exponential, but it's polynomial. Mm -hmm. And of course, the polynomial in the absolute is less than an exponential gap, but somehow this is not the end of the story in the sense that this polynomial is actually a very, very large polynomial, meaning that if you look at instances where you would want to do recommendation systems, like looking at Amazon or Netflix or you know online uh, purchase systems like that, then actually this polynomial gap is even bigger than the one we had before, which was an exponential one. Hmm. But somehow, uh, from a theoretical point of view, it says that the gap that we have cannot be exponential, it's only polynomial. But from a practical point of view, which to me it's more interesting when it comes to machine learning because we really need to solve real problems, the gap is even bigger than it was before. So, so we still have to see how to take this gap and actually implement it in a quantum computer that we don't have yet. Mm -hmm. And obviously there will be you know, slowdowns because the clock speed of a quantum computer is not as fast as a classical computer and things like that. But we still have a very decent... A theoretical gap of something like a million or a billion times faster, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully out of this billion times faster, we can keep something that makes sense. Because even if you say it's a thousand times faster in practice, this would be a really, really great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, also speaks to the idea that even if we don't ever get to quantum computers that can run these algorithms, perhaps we learn you know, from the approaches we're developing and exploring yeah. quantum algorithms and kind of bring some of what we learn back, back to classical algorithms. This is absolutely true. And this was a great example uh, on the work of you on the recommendation systems. In machine learning, there are more examples like that. For example, when it comes to neural networks, uh, which is something that we know that it works very well, but we don't necessarily understand why and why this one does and the other one doesn't somehow. Like we've been trying to figure out what is the right architectures for defining some quantum neural networks. And the difference there, for example, have to do with things that it's not easy to apply a nonlinearity because it, quantum is a reversible and linear evolution. So then you have these extra constraints that make you think of different ways of defining neural networks. And this can also go back to classical neural networks and define new ways of doing classical neural networks that could use the intuition of the quantum to provide classical neural networks that can be more accurate or more efficient. So there is, there is a lot of back and forth between classical and quantum information. And this is why we need to work more closely with the classical ML community as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe we can take a step back and have you, um, you know, ground us on quantum computing and what are some of the the fundamental ideas there. I'll be honest; I've heard it, uh, you know, numerous times. <laughs> it's still uh, yeah. difficult to to wrap my head around superposition and and similar concepts. Um, uh, and so maybe you can, you know, start by talking about you know, what you think are the key ideas for folks that are coming from uh, classical approaches? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's not an easy task to do to explain quantum in uh, uh, live, but I will do my best. Um, I guess the first comment is to say that one does not need to really understand quantum mechanics and all the postulates of physics and quantum mechanics in order to start playing around with quantum algorithms and quantum information. Right. So for us, it's mostly a mathematical model that we need to understand, which is a little different than the one that we use for classical computing. And once you have this mathematical model in place, then in some sense, the physics part stops and then the algorithmic and the computer science part starts. Right. So the main difference between classical and quantum computing, people probably have heard this many times, is that the carrier of information is not a bit, which is a zero or a one but it's a quantum bit, which can be a zero and one at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not very different than saying that I have a random bit, that sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's one. So you can define the space of this random bit with two uh, probabilities, the probability of getting zero and the probability of getting one, right? So you can associate in, the, in a random bit a two-dimensional vector, right? 
It's the same thing that quantumly you can associate in a quantum bit a two-dimensional vector, but now this vector doesn't have positive probabilities that sum up to one. It has complex numbers whose squares sum up to one. Mm. In other words, if you have a quantum system, you can think of a quantum system as a vector in some very high dimensional uh, Euclidean space, right? The same way that if you have a random uh, variable, which is more than one bit, you can uh, think of a distribution, which is in, you know, in an exponential space, and you have positive probabilities that sum up to one. Here, the quantum system is defined by, again, an exponential size vector with positive or negative numbers, actually even complex numbers, whose squares sum up to one. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is the, 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 the basic difference, right, of how do you encode information and what is the carrier of information in, in quantum. And once you have this, then you want to understand how can I evolve the system. So I have a quantum system. What kind of operations can I apply to this quantum system to evolve it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very simple in some sense because you want to evolve a quantum system in a way that the quantum system remains a quantum system. Right? So since the quantum system was this, this vector in Hilbert space with some fixed norm, let's say norm one, then the only kind of operations that you can apply to it is some unitary operation because this is the operation that keeps the norm of the vector the same. Right? The same way that we're saying if I have a probability distribution, how can I evolve it? I can apply a stochastic matrix because it keeps from a probability distribution, it will give you a probability distribution. Here you have a quantum state, you apply a unitary matrix, you're going to get a different quantum state, but still a quantum state, right? So this is easily the way of applying operations on quantum systems. The quantum system is a vector, you apply a unitary matrix, you get a different vector, mm -hmm. right? And the second thing, and this is also very important that you can do to this quantum system, is that you can try to observe it, right? But kind of what we know from the uh, postulates of quantum mechanics is that when you observe something, this is not just a passive observation that doesn't change anything. But right. the moment you try to observe the system, the state of the system changes itself, right? Mm -hmm. So the quantum measurement just specifies uh, what will be the outcomes that you're going to get, the possible outcomes that you're going to get out of this observation, and with what probability each outcome will, will come up. Right? So when you measure something, then you'll have a distribution over possible classical outcomes that come from this quantum state that you had before. So I know it's a mouthful, but uh, basically if we understand this, this, the notion of a qubit and the fact that I can apply a unitary operation to it or I, or I can measure it and observe some classical information out of it, then we basically have uh, the basics that we need in order to start talking about quantum algorithms. And maybe the, 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 the one simple quantum procedure that I can discuss, and uh, it's quite interesting for machine learning, is the one that has to do with estimating the distance between uh, quantum states, right? So you can think of two quantum states as uh, encodings of two data points, right? And one of the things that we need to do many times in machine learning is figure out the similarity between these two points, right? So you want to estimate something like the inner product between these two points. As, as long as these uh, data points are now encoded into these quantum states, it's, it's fairly efficient to compute the distance or the inner product between these uh, data points. And this is one of the things that we use in order to do, for example, classification or clustering based on uh, similarity learning. Mm -hmm. I can talk maybe if, uh, about one more, a little more elaborate thing that we can do without getting into many of the details, which is uh, linear algebra procedures. And again, I'm talking about this because machine learning is a lot of, you know, linear algebra, whether you want to train neural networks, but also when you want to do um, more traditional machine learning, like uh, principal component analysis or support vector machines. There are always these matrices that you have to handle. You need to figure out, you know, uh, top eigenspaces, eigenvectors, and things like that. So quantum is particularly uh, powerful 
in performing this type of computations that have to do with eigenvalues and eigenvectors in a more efficient way. These tools are very powerful, but they're also very subtle. And this is where a lot of the hype comes also uh, when it comes to quantum machine learning. These procedures are not always faster, but they can be faster if we really pay attention and we apply them to the right applications and do the right use cases. Mm -hmm. right? And when we do that, this is how we can get very fast recommendation systems, faster both than the classical or the quantumly inspired classical, still much faster when we apply it to things like spectral clustering or expectation maximization, things where uh, this linear alg algebra uh, part is really the bottleneck of the computation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you alluded to this uh, earlier, and I think it's really coming out in this conversation around the the algorithms. The, the the speed up that we're talking about here doesn't come from just running it on a super fast, you know, hardware that actually doesn't really yeah. exist. It's because there's something fundamental about the way we can work with qubits, you know, that we can't do. Yeah you know, bits. Uh, and I'm yeah. thinking of it as a nonlinearity. That's probably not the right way to think about it, but you can do the different things. Can you mm -hmm. help us get to the essence of what these different things are that we can do that make things faster? Sure. I, I will do my best again. You know, <laughs> quantum mechanics is not the easiest thing to, to, to get intuition about. And there are many things that we don't really understand. Uh, but I think the, the main idea of why you would expect um, a quantum algorithm to be faster, for example, than a classical algorithm is because we can utilize this notion of superposition, right? When I talk about superposition, it means that, for example, imagine you want to estimate the distance between one point and many different points, right? It could be the centroids that you have pre-calculated from different classes or some other data points. What we can do is things like, instead of estimating the distance of the point with each one of the data points, one after the other, so we have to spend a lot of time if the number of these points is, is great, right? We can kind of go into a superposition of the data points and kind of start estimating fast things that have to do with the average distance or things like that. So, I would maybe say that it's some sort of parallelism that is happening at some point, but we should not think of it as a parallel computer either. <laughs> so it's not a nonlinear computer and it's not a parallel computer. Uh -huh. And it's certainly not a faster, just a faster processor, right? So right. I usually get this question, shouldn't be just simpler if we just get a compiler that will take my classical algorithm, make it into a quantum algorithm, and then I don't have to learn anything new and I will be done. It's not that easy. It's not that easy because you not really have to understand. Mentally, it's just not that easy. Yeah. It's, it's fundamentally different. Uh, you can use this parallelism, this superposition, at the same time, as we said, every time you try to extract information out of these things, you end up destroying your states and mm -hmm. you get only a small part of the information. So there's this interplay between using this, this big Hilbert space to encode information, but figuring out very clever ways of extracting the information that you need and not care about the rest. So... I guess this is the best way I could explain it in a couple of uh, minutes. Well, what I'm hearing is something, uh, you know, the, the picture that's forming that's probably inaccurate is, is something along the lines of, you know, in classical computings, in classical computing, we, you know, do a lot of iterative uh, types of computation. And there is an element of, you know, these properties of, of quantum superposition and observation that allows us to, to kind of look at uh, a quantum data structure and get a lot of what we might otherwise have to iterate uh, in classical computing. Is, is there mm -hmm. any of that that is true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> no, no. It's true that um, I think 
a different way of looking at it could be that what the quantum computer enables you to do is kind of search many different computational paths at the same time. Mm. But this is not enough because then if you just say, let me search all of them in superposition and then let me measure, then what you get is just a random path, which you could have done it also by a randomized classical algorithm, right? Yeah. Okay. So what you need to do is, first of all, go into a superposition of these paths, but then figure out clever ways of just getting rid of the paths that you don't like, so that at the end, only the good paths that, you, that are, will lead to a solution remain as possibilities of the quantum algorithm. So there is this inherent stochasticity in, in quantum, mm -hmm. okay, which is also in randomized algorithm. Mm -hmm. The extra thing is that because, as I said, we don't deal only with probabilities, but also with these positive, negative, complex amplitudes, there is a lot of interference between these paths. And if you're clever enough, you will interfere the bad paths and you will make them disappear. And you will only get good paths that lead to solutions at the end of your algorithm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so you, you've, you've got these kind of principles like being able to do distances and, and linear algebra. How does that get us to quantum machine learning algorithms and kind of what's mm -hmm. the current you know, state and landscape of quantum ML? Yeah, it's a very nice question. So I can start maybe from the simplest thing. So we can start with supervised learning and, you know, the first thing that one might want to do would be some sort of classification, right? So uh, again, there are two different ways of, okay, there are many different ways of trying to do classification. One of them is based on similarity uh, learning, right? So you somehow map your data points into some points in space, and then you try to figure out which points are close to each other so that you can give them one label and which other points are far and close so you can give them a different label, right? So this is things that, Kind of everyone knows in classical machine learning we are you know getting to understand more and more what's happening and again there one thing the simplest thing you can do is to say that okay every time you want to estimate the distance why don't you use a quantum computer to to estimate the distance right but you can go a little bit more in a more quantum versions of these things where you say okay but maybe not only do i want to estimate each distance separately but imagine that i want to I have a point, I have a bunch of different centroids. I want to soft uh, classify my point depending on which centroid is closer to me, right? So different things you can do is not do it one by one sequentially, but again, go to the superposition of the centroids and this will allow you to sample the right centroid with the correct probabilities, for example. So these are kind of the things that you can do in the simplest problems like you already have your points and you want to classify them in, in the space that you are, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to, 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 be, to go to a next level, we can say that many times uh, before being able to classify your points, you need to pre-process your data and map them from one space to a different space. For example, through some dimensionality reduction techniques, we can think of principal component analysis or feature analysis, uh, linear discriminant, and all these type of uh, very powerful classical techniques. And the reason they're very powerful is also because they are computationally hard to do, right? Because you need to figure out the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of your, of your data matrices. And there we can use more uh, powerful and elaborate quantum procedures that have to do with uh, inverting matrices, finding eigenvectors. So this mapping from, from uh, a higher dimensional space of your data points to a smaller dimensional space where you believe that the classification will be good, for example, by looking at your top eigenspace, then this mapping can also be done in a quantum way. And uh, this is usually, most of the times, the bottleneck of the classification, how to find the right space to, to put your 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 points. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also try to, to define quantum deep learning and quantum neural networks. Before we go there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you started talking about uh, quantum with quantum supervised learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, you've got this, uh, the, uh, the way you described it was 
use quantum computing for the distance part of that task as opposed to mm -hmm. the, the entire task? Is that typical yep. of a quantum approach that you kind of cherry pick a particular part that's hard classically and apply quantum to it as opposed to end-to-end mm -hmm. -end quantum? Mm -hmm. Both both cases are possible, right? For example, if you have an algorithm that, like I give you a number and you need to factor the number into two prime factors, then the entire algorithm is a quantum algorithm. And because the entire algorithm is a quantum algorithm, this is why we need like millions and millions of qubits to actually implement this algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. There are more hybrid uh, algorithms where uh, there is a classical outer algorithm and then at the specific points one can uh, do a specific part of the computation on on a quantum computer get back a result and continue with the classical uh, program the classical algorithm right mm -hmm. for example you, you you're, you're very right to say that when i was discussing about something like nearest centroid classification many parts will still happen classically because quantum cannot offer something to that mm -hmm. right figuring out the centroids of, of a labeled set of data. It's pretty simple. It's never the bottleneck classically, so let's do it classically, right? Then at some point when you have to find distances or you have to start projecting data points to different spaces, then for the specific task, we can use a quantum computer and then we can you know, continue within our classical algorithm. So for the way we do it at QCWare, for example, when we say we have a quantum nearest centroid algorithm, what it looks to, to someone who wants to use it is basically the same that using scikit-learn to do classical nearest centroids. There is a Python environment, you have a notebook and you run it. So this is exactly what the quantum thing can, feels like. You just say instead of run your uh, classical nearest centroid and fit your data and predict it, you say fit and predict your data with the quantum nearest centroid. And what happens at the back is that there is a classical program that at some point says, send this data to your quantum computer, measure your quantum computer, get some classical data out, and continue with your classical computation. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that this raises for me is I, I think of, you know, when you've got these quantum algorithms operating in the uh, context of classical approaches and classical mm -hmm. problems and, and kind of regular data um i guess there was a part of a part of the way i was thinking about this that wanted the classical algorithms to be operating on classical data like really complex data with these you know weird states and you know crazy mm -hmm. dimensions and things like that um you know what's the relationship between the the data and the quantum mm -hmm. algorithm and, and do you have to do something to data to, to make it operable in a quantum mm -hmm. environment? Doesn't it have to be more yeah. complex? Very good question. It's, uh, you're really pinpointing on one of the very important and subtle points for quantum machine learning. And this is what do we do with classical data and how do we load classical data into a quantum format, which is the one that we need in order to run our quantum algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. So let me try to explain a little bit what this is. So you have some classical data, you have some classical description of a point in some n-dimensional space, right? What we would need um, in order to apply some fast, for example, quantum linear algebra techniques or estimating the distances and things like that, we need some quantum state that in some sense encodes this classical data point into this quantum state, okay? And this is not a priori a trivial thing to do. We are asking to create a quantum state out of a classical dis description of classical data. Um, so there are many different ways of approaching the, uh, this task. One is to, to, to say that we will need to develop some uh, special type hardware, like your classical RAM that you have on your computer that you can say, okay, just load the data that exists in position uh, 35, then your RAM goes to position 35 and brings back this data. You don't have, you know, as it used to be with tapes and uh, this starts from the beginning and, you know, go all the way to the point that you want. So you have this fast access to the data, 
right? What uh, we would need for a quantum computer is also to have some sort of fast quantum access to this data, right? So there were a few proposals that had to do with some kind of more exotic technological things to, to do it on hardware, right? What we try to do uh, with QCWare, and I've been working on this for quite some time now, is to figure out can we efficiently load classical data with current quantum technology? Like, I don't want to use anything that doesn't exist. I want to use machines that Google or IBM is coming up with, right? And can I use these types of machines to load classical data on quantum states? And what we found is kind of the optimal ways of doing it. So the optimal way says that the circuit that you need uh, in order to load a, a data point that has n features must have size n, otherwise you are missing your data, right? But you can have it in a very, very shallow way. So the depth of the circuit that kind of corresponds to the time that it will take for the quantum circuit to actually apply this uh, operation is only logarithmic on the dimension of the data. Which means that I need these uh, qubits, which, which have optimal size, and I can make them very, very shallow, which means very, very fast. Okay, and this is one of the ways, one of the bottlenecks that we, we managed to, to, to get over with. And this is why, you know, if someone told me maybe three years ago, how far is real quantum machine learning applications, I would have predicted something which would have been further down the road than I could say now. Uh, it, it sounds like the, the process of applying quantum algorithms then uh, if it assumes that you are accessing you know quantum data and that quantum data was originally uh you know real world you know data points say some you know time series data points or something the it does the process of using quantum algorithms inject some noise you know noise in the sense of you know these kind of you know static data points are projected into some probabilistic quantum space and um you know is is that a a disadvantage that quantum has to overcome in order to be useful on i don't know what is non is, is there a set of i guess you could apply quantum to physics problems and you've got this inherently quantum data source but for everything else mm -hmm. um, yeah very good question. Uh, so we will have to deal with noise in the quantum setting. And we do have to deal with noise first because the computers that we have now or that we will have in a few years will be noisy. Meaning that when I have a qubit and I tell my qubit just go to this state, the qubit doesn't really go to this state, but to a state close to that state, right? Uh, and this is because it's extremely difficult to really control quantum systems at that level of precision, right? So there will be noise, and this is why we call the era that we are now, and we will be in the next few years, the NISC era for noisy intermediate scale quantum machines, okay? <laughs> and now it's John Preskill who, who coined the, <laughs> the, the, the term, it wasn't me, so... <laughs> uh, and the question is, is this noise going to kill the quantum machine learning applications or not, right? Uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. And I will tell you why I'm quite optimistic. Because the data that we have, even for classical machine learning, are already very noisy, right? The whole point of machine learning is try to extract the signals out of very noisy data. Right. right. So if I tell you that you have a bunch of data and then I perturb a little bit the data, all of them, right? If I have, you know, cats here and dogs there and I perturb all the cats and the dogs, you're, you expect your machine learning algorithm to still be able to, to discern a cat from a dog, right? Because already the data that you learned on, for example, were very noisy and very fuzzy images of cats and dogs, right? So somehow there is already noise on the data, okay? So for the quantum case, there will be noise on the data in the sense that if you give me a quantum, a classical data point, 
the quantum state that I will construct will be close to the correct point, but not exactly. Mm -hmm. And then quantum will add even more noise when I try to estimate, for example, the inner product or the distance between two points. That computation will also have a little bit of noise there. But again, this is something that we even do in classical machine learning. Mm -hmm. For example, when we're training neural networks, many times we inject artificial noise on the computation because we want our neural network to be robust, right? right? right. We want it to be robust. We want to, to be robust against uh, both adversarial uh, uh, adversaries, but also as a way to increase the privacy of the data. So this is also something very interesting that I'm quite interested recently is that one, the main way maybe to, to, to deal with privacy in, in machine learning is, is, is again to make your, your data a little bit more noisy or the computation a little bit more noisy in the sense that it's enough noise to hide specifics of the data, right. but still you can extract the useful information that you need in order to solve your problem. Mm -hmm. So somehow this is how the quantum thing will do, not because you want it to do it, but because it will do it by itself. Right, so privacy or something like that. Yes, it's inherently private. <laughs> and, and so is the is this idea of yeah, understanding the the way that noise um, it is uh, injected from kind of classical realm to to quantum realm? Is this? Uh, you know, kind of a, a pedestrian thing that, you know, is assumed and no one cares about, or is this like a, a research topic that, you know, people are working towards an information theory of quantum or something, you know, like that? Yeah. I No, it's very important. It's very important. For example, I will, I will just give you a small, a small example, right? And we, we were, we started working on unsupervised learning and we started from, you know, clustering 101. So we wanted to find a quantum analog of k-means, mm -hmm. right? And we figured out what the algorithm should look like. But as I said, every time we will be doing a quantum procedure, we were adding noise to the computation, mm -hmm. right? So what we had to do is to go back to the classical algorithm and say, okay, even classically, if I start adding noise now, and we know what type of noise, we were adding, would the clustering still be good or not? Mm -hmm. Right? So what we did is that we did extensive simulations on real, real data sets like MNIST and IRIS and many different, you know, canonical, let's call them, data set where people, uh, actually not for clustering, they were more, you know, synthetic data in other ones. But uh, we looked at what happens when your classical k-means algorithm has noise in it. Right? We defined a, a new classical clustering algorithm. And what we found out is that, obviously, as long as your noise is not enormous, where everything becomes noise, right? You, your clustering doesn't lose anything from, from the accuracy for decent amounts of noise. Right? Even for decent amount of noise, you still have very good clustering. Okay? Of course, you can find data that will destroy your algorithm. Right? But when you test it on the data that you expect to run your clustering algorithm on, you can handle a lot of noise. And this is uh, what also enabled us, and this is some results that we uh, published last year at NeurIPS, uh, to figure out both what we expect from the quantum algorithm to give as accuracy, and also how much faster it will actually be because the running time of the quantum algorithm depends on how precise or how noisy you can you want your computation right the more precise you need the computation the more time you have to spend but the fact that even having quite big noise the accuracy did not suffer we could say that the running time of the quantum algorithm when you have a bigger computer would be much faster than the classical uh, k means algorithm and so were those results that were only accessible to you via simulation and comparison, or is there some theoretical framework that says under a set of conditions, we know that, you know, the noise will be decent in, you know, mm -hmm. converting this over to quantum? Yeah. 
So yeah, I come from a computer science uh, background. So obviously we had to prove the theorems, right? Okay. And um, we proved exactly the trade-off between how much error you can have in the commutation okay. versus how much running time, how, how, how long you have to run, Got it. right? And then by simulations, we we figured out the errors that you can handle and still have good accuracy. And for that error, we went back and we said, okay, so what is the running time and how fast will the algorithm be? And this we took from asymptotic theoretical analysis of how the k-means algorithm, the quantum k-means algorithm works. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. Uh, so you're about to... Uh speak a bit about quantum neural networks. Yes, quantum neural networks is, 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 is a very intriguing to me because we are in a very bizarre situation. And I think maybe in classical machine learning, people were in a similar situation maybe 20 or 30 years ago, where we kind of think we have ideas on what the architectures of quantum neural networks should be, right? To do things like classification. But we only have like 10 or 20 qubits to try things out and see how they work. So it's the same as telling you, propose to me a neural network that you think can classify well, but you cannot simulate it. So then you're kind of stuck because you cannot prove many things for neural networks. The main thing that you do is that you run it and you see that it works. And if it doesn't work, then you see how to tweak it to make it work, right? So for us, it's very difficult because we don't have the ability to actually simulate these quantum neural networks because every time you try to simulate it on a classical computer, there is this exponential blow up on the time. So if I have a neural network of 100 qubits, then I need two to the 100 dimension for my classical computer to simulate it. And I don't have 100 qubits to run it on either. So it's very difficult to find ways of really uh, giving evidence, if not proofs, of why we, we would expect these quantum neural networks to work. So what we did on, on our side is two things. The first thing we said, okay, let's not define quantum neural networks. Let's go back to classical neural networks. We know that they work, they work very well. Can I speed up the training of them if I have a quantum computer on the side? So I'm not going to use a quantum circuit as a quantum neural network, but I'm going to use the algorithms on a quantum computer to train my classical neural network faster, right? And again, because there is a lot of linear algebra there, we can also prove that in some cases there are speed ups that you can get from, from quantum training, okay? And the second case was that we are trying to, to, to use the intuition that we have from quantum algorithms Mm -hmm. to at least come up with quantum architectures where we can prove something very simple that they're not going to be worse than the classical ones. Even that is not very clear, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get kind of guarantees that say that if you run this quantum neural network, at least you have the guarantee that it will run at least as well as an equivalent classical one. And hopefully it will run better, but you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so is that second part, ha have you developed the, the quantum neural networks or? So we have some, uh, for now, there's some internal work with uh, QCWare where we develop some new architectures based on the intuition that we got from, from how to load quantum data. Because as I said, this is also something fairly new. What, what are the optimal ways of loading data? Because for a neural network, this is kind of, you know, half of the thing that you have to do is load the data and then pass it through the neural network. So the, the fact that we figured out the optimal ways of loading the data and doing inner products with different data, this is what kind of gave us the intuition of how we should be defining these quantum architectures. And hopefully we will be able to get some more theoretical guarantees. We are working on it. We are not there yet, but we are quite hopeful that uh, we will be able to, to, to at least propose some architectures with some provable guarantees now. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a way to characterize where we are with quantum neural networks uh, in, in kind of the language that we use for uh, classical neural networks? Like, you know, we're at the, you know, single hidden layer feed forward, you know, network stage or, you mm -hmm. know. So I think. Or is quantum orthogonal to the kind of complexity that we see in, in classical? So if you're asking about what type of experiments we can do, right, on a real quantum computer, mm -hmm. I think some of the, the, the most impressive experiments is to say that let me look at the MNIST data set of hundreds and digits. I will only pick two digits instead of 10 because I cannot handle 10, I can handle two of them. And instead of 700 pixels, we used four pixels <laughs> and we tried to, to, to figure out if you have threes versus one by looking at four pixel, you know, blurry images of threes and ones. <laughs> so when it comes to real hardware, you know, real data, we're very far from figuring out whether quantum neural networks will work or not. Right, and that and that's why, limitation of the number of qubits that we have to work with, kind of the 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 width yeah. of our compute box. At the same time, we have pr many different proposals for architectures of how this quantum neural network should look like. Okay. It's, a, it's very difficult to to prove anything, and you cannot test them. So that's why what we are trying to do is is come up with an architecture where you can at least have some guarantees some provable guarantees. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It's not easy, but uh, we're making progress. Everyone, many people are working on this. We're making progress. The progress, I think, will be much faster when we get our hands on better hardware because this is kind of, I mean, deep learning is empirical to some extent, right? You need to try it out. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, are uh, people doing, you know, anything approximating kind of, you know, the, the, you know, very sophisticated networks, you know, uh, quantum CNNs or quantum deep reinforcement learning or, um, it, you know, on paper at least. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, we had a paper at last year's ICLR where we, we, we discussed quantum convolutional neural networks. Okay. Uh, on our side, that paper was very theoretical in the sense that we used classical CNNs and quantum ways of training this, the, the CNNs. Okay, there have been some proposals on uh, quantum CNNs as well. Uh, you have to find quantum ways to do the different layers, like the pooling, the you know applying the nonlinearity, and this type of uh, things. Again, ideas are out there. We need to find better ideas. We'll be getting better ideas when we find ways of, of trying out things and figuring out why they work or why they not work. For example, a quantum circuit is a reversible computation. It's a linear, op these unitaries are linear operations. So the first thing is how do you apply a, a nonlinearity if you, if you have a linear operator, right? So even that is not, obvious what is the correct way of injecting nonlinearity in a quantum neural network. There are many different things. Maybe I, I, I will measure and then I get a sample and this induces a nonlinear element. Maybe I need to get rid of some of the qubits and look at a subset of qubits. This also includes some nonlinear element. So even that is not trivial in the many different ways. Uh, and anything on the reinforcement learning side? Reinforcement learning, uh, I think it's probably the least advanced uh, area. Also, it's, it's, it's also not the, the easiest one, that's why. So we started with supervised learning a few years ago, uh, unsupervised learning last year, and there have been very few papers on quantum reinforcement learning. Um, what we did... Uh, with uh, with a student of mine is to look at uh, policy iteration before we go to deep reinforcement learning, even through you know 
iterative methods, as you, as you said, and solving linear systems one after the other to update your policy and improve your policy and things like that. Um, there are things we can do. And I think reinforcement learning is, is, is quite interesting for quantum for different reasons. One of the reasons is that you don't have this problem that we discussed earlier of loading data because it's not like you have images which you have no idea about and you need to really look at all the data and load it. Your data in the reinforcement learning is basically what you have learned of your game by taking some moves and figuring out you know, where you're going. So you can kind of produce the data as you are exploring uh, your state space, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is easier data in the sense that we can construct data and it's not just data that we have to store and, and load from, from memory, right? So this is one of the reasons why I do think that reinforcement learning is, is a very interesting thing for quantum algorithms. And then adding DeepRL into the mixture, uh, yes, it's a great thing to do. Uh, not much has been done, but uh, as I told you, we are a very young field. We have pretty much five years five good years of doing things and we're a very small community. So hopefully after, you know, the ICML talk and the interview with you, more people from the classic LML community will start getting interesting about saying, you know, what, what is this thing out there? And I'm very happy to talk to people and, you know, figure out how to work together. Mm -hmm. What are the, the limitations of, um, we, we drew this kind of distinction early on between classical algorithms, I'm sorry, between quantum algorithms and quantum computing. Uh, and a lot of the, the things we're looking for, um, a lot of the interesting work is in the algorithms and independent of, you know, being able to run them. Um, yeah, to what degree is, is simulation viable for quantum algorithms? Can we simulate quantum algorithms in a, a classical machine? Mm -hmm. So if you want to, to simulate a general quantum computation, a quantum algorithm on 100 qubits, then the, the equivalent classical problem that you need to solve has dimension 2 to the 100. Precisely because this a state of a, quant a quantum the state of a quantum system of 100 qubits is a 2 to the 100 dimensional vector. Mm -hmm. So this is why the maximum quantum system that we can simulate classically is something between 30 and 40. I think for now there's something like 32, 34, 36, and this is the limit because you get to things like 2 to the 32 where you know, you're touching the limits of what you, you can do. And we're depending on what kind of qubits or, or how you count or which vendor we're kind of at that point with quantum machines now. So we, is that, mm -hmm. we're, like, we're beyond the point where um, it makes sense to, to simulate because we have access to the actual machines that are beyond the capacity of, of what we can simulate. Is that mm -hmm. You are right that, for example, both Google and IBM have a 53 qubit machine. Mm -hmm. So we will never be able to simulate a general computation on 53 qubits because you, you would have this 2 to the 53 object that you have to handle. Uh, at the same time, this would be the case if you had perfect qubits, somehow that you know what they do, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you have... 50 qubits that are so noisy, then it's very easy to simulate what will happen at the end. It will be just garbage, <laughs> right? And this was exactly the point where what Google managed to do with the supremacy experiment is to, is to have these 53 qubits good enough that at the end you don't get total garbage, but with very small probability you get something that has to do with what you were trying to compute, right? <laughs> And this is exactly the point where, where the reason we call this, uh, you know, and I think it's a very important experiment, right? The experiment said that you have nowadays a machine that can do something completely useless, but something that you cannot simulate classically, mm -hmm. right? Now, 
the holy grail is to go from something completely useless to something very useful that also you cannot do with a classical computer. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're trying to reach this point with quantum machine learning, with quantum chemistry, with quantum optimization. We are not there yet, but we are doing good progress. And I think, you know, the only thing we can do, and I think this is my responsibility as a scientist as well, is to try to accelerate uh, this process so that we can get to real world applications as fast as possible, because at the end, we do want to, to have an impact and to make this world a better place. So we're trying our best. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Yodanis, thanks so much for taking the time to, to share with us a bit about your recent uh, keynote and, and your research. Uh, fascinating topic and, and conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the invitation, really.